Chapter Five, A Fair Start. The name of the coachman was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage, very near the stables. The next morning he took me into the yard and gave me a good grooming, and just as I was going into my box with my coat soft and bright, the squire came in to look at me and seemed pleased. John, he said, I meant to have tried the new horse this morning, but I have other business. You may as well take him around after breakfast. Go by the common and the high wood and back by the water mill and the river. That will show his paces. I will, sir," said John. After breakfast, he came and fitted me with a bridle. He was very particular in letting out and taking in the straps to fit my head comfortably. Then he bought a saddle, but it was not broad enough for my back. He saw it in a minute and went for another, which fitted nicely. He rode me first slowly, then a trot, then a canter, and when we were on the common, he gave me a light touch with his whip, and we had a splendid gallop. Ho, ho, my boy," he said as he pulled me up. "You would like to follow the hounds, I think." As we came back through the park, we met the squire and Mrs. Gordon walking. They stopped, and John jumped off. "Well, John, how does he go?" "First rate, sir," answered John. "He is as fleet as a deer, and has a fine spirit too. But the lightest touch of the rein will guide him." Down at the end of the common, we met one of those travelling carts hung all over with baskets, rugs, and such like. You know, sir, many horses will not pass those carts quietly. He just took a good look at it and then went on as quiet and pleasant as could be. They were shooting rabbits near the high wood, and a gun went off close by. He pulled up a little and looked, but did not stir a step to right or left. I just held the rein steady and did not hurry him. And it's my opinion he has not been frightened or ill-used while he was young. That's well," said the squire. "I will try him myself tomorrow." The next day, I was brought up for my master. I remembered my mother's counsel and my good old master's, and I tried to do exactly what he wanted me to do. I found he was a very good rider and thoughtful for his horse too. When he came home, the lady was at the hall door as he rode up. "Well, my dear," she said, "how do you like him?" "He is exactly what John said," he replied. "A pleasanter creature I never wish to mount. What shall we call him?" Would you like Ebony? Said she. He is as black as Ebony. No, not Ebony. Will you call him Blackbird, like your uncle's old horse? No, he is far handsomer than old Blackbird ever was. Yes, she said. He really is quite a beauty, and he has such a sweet, good-tempered face, and such a fine, intelligent eye. What do you say to calling him Black Beauty? Black beauty, why, yes, I think that is a very good name. If you like, it shall be his name. And so it was. When John went into the stable, he told James that master and mistress had chosen a good, sensible English name for me that meant something, not like Marengo or Pegasus or Abdallah. They both laughed, and James said, "If it was not for bringing back the past." I should have named him Robbery, for I never saw two horses more alike. That's no wonder," said John. "Didn't you know that Farmer Gray's old Duchess was the mother of them both?" I had never heard that before, and so poor Robbery, who was killed at that hunt, was my brother. I did not wonder that my mother was so troubled. It seems that horses have no relations; at least they never know each other after they are sold. John seemed very proud of me. He used to make my mane and tail almost as smooth as a lady's hair, and he would talk to me a great deal. Of course, I did not understand all he said, but I learned more and more to know what he meant and what he wanted me to do. I grew very fond of him. He was so gentle and kind. He seemed to know just how a horse feels, and when he cleaned me, he knew the tender places and the ticklish places. When he brushed my head. He went as carefully over my eyes as if they were his own, and never stirred up any ill temper. James Howard, the stable boy, was just as gentle and pleasant in his way, so I thought myself well off. There was another man who helped in the yard, but he had very little to do with Ginger and me. A few days after this, I had to go out with Ginger in the carriage. I wondered how we should get on together. 
but except laying her ears back when I was led up to her, she behaved very well. She did her work honestly, and did her full share, and I never wished to have a better partner in double harness. When we came to a hill, instead of slackening her pace, she would throw her weight right into the collar, and pull away straight up. We had both the same sort of courage at our work, and John had oftener to hold us in than to urge us forward. He never had to use the whip with either of us. Then our paces were much the same, and I found it very easy to keep step with her when trotting, which made it pleasant, and Master always liked it when we kept step well, and so did John. After we had been out two or three times together, we grew quite friendly and sociable, which made me feel very much at home. As for Merrylegs, he and I soon became great friends. He was such a cheerful, plucky, good-tempered little fellow that he was a favourite with every one, and especially with Miss Jessie and Flora, who used to ride him about in the orchard, and have fine games with him and their little dog Frisky. Our master had two other horses that stood in another stable. One was Justice, a roan cob, used for riding or for the luggage cart. The other was an old brown hunter, named Sir Oliver. He was past work now, but was a great favourite with the master, who gave him the run of the park. He sometimes did a little light carting on the estate, or carried one of the young ladies when they rode out with their father, for he was very gentle, and could be trusted with a child as well as merry legs. The cob was a strong, well-made, good-tempered horse, and we sometimes had a little chat in the paddock, but of course I could not be so intimate with him as with Ginger, who stood in the same stable. End of chapter 5